I'm Max Holland, the Marina Kellen French Director of the Met, and also on behalf of our President Dan Weiss, I want to welcome you here tonight to this very special evening's lecture. Um, thank you so much for coming. I know it's raining outside, I know it's a busy season, but it's great that you are participating in what we want to share with you here tonight. So over the past few months, we had a series of architecture talks, basically, and we want to have this a lineup of three of the most world-renowned architects who are currently working together with us here at the Met to transform some of our galleries, to rejuvenate some of our narratives, to help us further architecturally uh, improve uh, this institution. Um, and this is now the third part of this lecture series, and I want to thank you, also the members of the Directors Fund for supporting this series. The architecture of the Met has been in constant flux, of course, ever since the Met kind of established its building here in the 1880s. Um, but it's certainly uh, here now a crucial moment in the history of this institution, but also in the history of, its, of the architecture of the institution, that we have embarked on transforming three major parts of this institution, um, almost simultaneously and with very powerful architects, with strong architectural voices, and with immediate impact to what the museum is, how the museum shows its collection, and how we move forward. We had uh, Frida Escobedo speak here about her first initial ideas and plans for the Met's uh, modern wing, the Tang wing. We had two weeks ago Nader Tarani here who spoke about his plans for the Engineer Eastern Galleries and the Superotic Galleries. And tonight, it's a great privilege and an honor to have Kula Patyantrasast here, the architecture who is currently reimagining our Michael C. Rockefeller wing, the galleries that are devoted to the arts of, the, of Sub Saharan Africa, of Oceania, and the ancient Americas. This is a very particular area of the museum. Nearly 50 years ago, with the groundbreaking of the Rockefeller Wing, a very special space was established. It was also a watershed moment for the development of this institution to show this, this, this collection in the concert of everything else that the Met had to offer at that time. So now, after 50 years, we want to reimagine that space. We also want to reintroduce these three major world cultural traditions, displaying them as discrete elements, but also showing some of the overarching themes, showing also how they connect to other parts of our cultures, other parts of the cultures that we display here, and to the 5,000 and more years of uh, cultural development that we show here at the Met. Since the transformative gift of Nelson Rockefeller uh, in 1969, a lot has happened in these areas of, of our collections. They have tripled in size through other major gifts, acquisitions, and uh, development there. So the reimagined galleries will not only be a completely new idea about how art is being displayed, and certainly Kulapat will talk more about that, but it will also show uh, a new idea about how we can understand, how we can appreciate these cultures, and how we can show them in a new context, in, and also in a new light. In November of 2018, the Met announced the important partnership with Kulapat Yantrasast and his uh, company Y Architecture for a monumental reconfiguration of this wing. It's been an extensive collaboration it's been a lot of work, I think probably more work that Kulapat would have imagined, uh, that, uh, that brought us here, working together with our curatorial teams, looking at every object, at every uh, question that come about, came about, about imagining the, the whole space, but also imagining every case uh, and, uh, and where we want to land now with something that will be so important and transformative and that we will open in 2025. So we're enormously grateful for that collaboration and we're enormously excited about the outcome that we already see now uh, coming to fruition. We are in the midst already of that construction. Kulapat is the founder and creative director of Y, an architectural practice that he opened in 2004. He studied mainly in, 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 in Tokyo um, 
And he's worked uh, as a close associate and, uh, and collaborator with Tadao Ando, um, leading several of, his, of the important US and European projects there, especially the Modern Art Museum in Fort Worth, the Clark Art Institute in Williamstown, and also um, his work on the Francois Pinot uh, collection. So uh, Kulapat already before he started his own practice came with a vast experience, not only of residential buildings, uh, but also of uh, major cultural institutions. By architecture did a number of um, museum buildings, architectural uh, configuration for galleries. Uh, the first major commission actually for, uh, uh, for by architecture was the Grand Rapids Art Museum in Michigan, uh, which basically then opened to, with to great fanfare. And then also the expansion of the Speed Art Museum, which opened recently. And also his extremely, why architects extremely thoughtful uh, reimagination of the gallery design for the Harvard Art Museums and also right now also working with the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, in the past year, the firm opened a number of projects like the Northwest Coast Hall at the American Museum of Natural History, very much also applauded the Academy Museum of, of Art Motion Picture in Los Angeles. Just recently here in New York, the David Kodansky Gallery. Uh, and, and many others that uh, has, uh, has happened in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, Kulapat is a very busy architect. Um, and while, he, while his probably CV and the Wikipedia entry says he lives and works in Los Angeles, I have to say that's not true. Um, uh, <laughs> Kulapat lives all around the world. Uh, and I have to say, I think he works on airplanes because there, there's no other way how he can, how he can do this major output of what his architectural practice and his great team does. Um, and we are extremely privileged to have him not only as our architect in this whole project, but to have him here uh, tonight and uh, that he spends time with us here, uh, sharing his plans, sharing his ideas, sharing his perspectives also on what the Rockefeller wing will bring about, but boils in, in a broader context. Um, he will be joined after his uh, initial uh, uh, talk by Alisa Lagama, uh, the Seal and Michael E. Pulitzer Curator for African Art and the curator in charge of the Michael C. Rockefeller Wing, who has worked with uh, Kulapat from the very uh, beginning on, together with the entire team of the Rockefeller Wing, uh, to bring this big plan, this, this big dream, this big idea to fruition. And so it's really also Alisa and her entire team's uh, so to see, work that you will now see uh, come to fruition uh, in the next couple of uh, years when we, and then when we open in 2025. So it's now my pleasure to ask Kulabad Yandersas to come here up to the stage. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. It is such an honor to work here. Everyone say it's a chance of a lifetime, and it is true. It's our lifetime, but also what we do will stand beyond our lifetime. It will be here for many generations, just like generations before us. So with that, I'm very humble and grateful. And I would like to start by really thanking everyone in this room, because you're here for a reason. Starting from the department, uh, led by Alisa Lagama, and all the curators, Maya, Joanne, Christine, and everyone, they've been working together tirelessly. We take trips together, we look at things together, we have a lot of discussions and challenges together. We will not be here without your trust and your understanding, so that's the part. And of course, uh, the Department of Design Construction, led by Jalen Hernandez Eli and many teams of his, the project managers, the engineers, and many others who really bring the different way of looking into the picture we, we support, without that support, we will not be here on time and moving along as we are today. And also, uh, I'm here as a representative of a big, big design team. It's not just me. I'm just a figurehead doing something on the plane, like what Max mentioned. <laughs> but I think that within that, I, of course, would, will uh, neglect to thank my own team, led by uh, Byron Chang right here, Joseph Savin and Brian Butterfield, who's been working closely with me from the beginning and dealing with the day-to-day -day pressure and tension and challenges that come through. 
And of course, uh, our really strong collaboration with Bayer Blinder Bell, which allow us to really be able to imagine uh, these spaces together, bring in expertise, bring in team that include engineers and consultants. Again, it's always very difficult uh, as we think of architect as one person in the fountainhead style. But behind that, there's a whole team of orchestras and symphony that make that music happen. So I would like to thank everyone at this point. And so I would like to propose a discussion today. I use uh, the title Three Whys and Five Hows as a way of talking about reasons and solution. The first why is, why me? So uh, as Max kindly mentioned, I was born in Thailand, which is a small country between China and India, but educate mostly and work mostly in Japan before I move uh, to America. So this is my trajectory as I go around the world in 80 years. So from Thailand to Japan to Los Angeles to New York and Paris and back to Thailand. So I was going around and in my journey as an immigrant uh, around the places, surprisingly it touched on all the regions that the Rockefeller Wing has represented across two oceans and be able to be part of continents. And within that, I develop a sense of what culture and museums mean as a, as a place we all get together, as a place we understand each other. But to give a little bit of my background of how I think about things, culture, I would like to talk a little bit about food and architecture. So I was born in Thailand, which is a small country between, again, India and China. And I spent a lot of time and formative years in Japan, which is at the edge. Thailand is a small, skinny person between two big giants. We have India and we have China. So when you're one small person in the middle seat, you really learn to watch your elbow room. You learn to really absorb all the movement and influence from these two people. And our culture, especially in our food, refute, uh, really reflect that. We have everything from Chinese influence, Indian influence, indigenous herbs, and many things can roll into that thing. And so as a Thai person, I'm very surprised and proud that for a tiny culture, we could really mix all these things together and really present a distinct cultural heritage back to the world, which is the opposite from Japan. Japan is the edge of the island. He's all the way back, you know, he had the whole city himself in coach isolated from the rest of the world, it's very difficult to go. So he has all the time to refine and think about what culture means to him, take in influence as he needs to, sit there refining and thinking about what Japanese sense of place uh, essay should be. So I'm saying that because I think it's important for us to think about culture and what we sit in that place and talked about using food, which is would be its own separate subject about food and architecture, which is something I'm obsessed about. But starting Japanese food, Japanese food is all about clarity of thoughts. It's about strength by unity, one flair of a time, depth of experience, order and clarity, refining, refining, refining. That's what Japanese sense of cuisine and culture is. Thai food is the opposite. It's so mixing, it's about harmony of differences, it's about diverse, open improvisations and putting things together and create something unique out of it. And that's the kind of background that I grew up between the two places, which is interesting because I think when I learn architecture, it's all about the clarity of thought. It's about the purity of, of ideas. But in a time, whose ideas is it? Like, are we endorsing just one narrative? I, I, more and more, I think, as I work within the, the realm of, of art and culture, that we're moving away from the Japanese sushi as a model to a Thai model because the idea there's one singular culture, one singular agenda that can really roll and really make people educate or cultivate in that sense, is getting more and more questionable. When the idea of diversity of ideas coming through, how do we bring this all together, make sure that it harmonizes in a way to create a beautiful music at the end? And I think for that reason, I think the Thai food way of thinking might have a little bit of a, of a help as we move through our process of diversity and inclusion. So why number two? Why why? So we are, you know, as Max kindly mentioned, started 2004 in Los Angeles and in New York. Many of our team are here, so thank you for coming. 
um, uh, again, from the get-go, we think of ourselves not as a hammer looking for a nail. We're not trying to fix all the same solution. We have workshops that we situate our, our project to try to find the right skill set and the, the right team for it. We have buildings, which is architecture, objects, whether it's art installation and furniture. We have museums that we talked about, museum planning, scenography, museum design, exhibit design. We have landscape, and we also have ideas that talked about thinking and research and linking all the things together. Again, I think that's the part that I feel that a uh, good contribution because we like to work with people to think differently from the get-go. We'd like to have in the room not just architect, we have landscape architect, we have researcher, we have others. And in the process, designing always bring people up together. And I call this ecology of disciplines because I feel that by bringing in the diversity from in the kitchen from the get-go, we, we start to really understand the breadth of solutions and possibility that should be part of the solution. So yeah, I'm, I'm very proud to say that 18 years into the work, all the workshops are very strong with projects all over the country, all over the world. And that's one thing that I'm very proud as someone who see this group together grow and thrive. One thing which is my own uh, uh, kind of pet peeve or interest is that the idea of trying to find solutions that combine why and why not. Why mean the logic, the reason to exist, the rational thinking, or even the practical aspect of things. Why not is the imagination, the dream, the surprises, the delight that come from something intangible. And I feel that in design, uh, ration alone is not, is not enough. Uh, imagination alone is not enough. We have to bring them two together to create something firm and practical, but also uplifting. So as Max kindly mentioned, uh, this is our first museum, the Grand Rapids Art Museum, which is the first legal museum in the country and in the world. We learned a lot from the project about sustainability. Uh, we, we worked from 2004 to 7 on these. It is the first green museum, so we really are pioneer about how to bring sus su sustainable solutions to museum design. But not only that, we also want sustainability to connect with beauty and civic pride. For example, in this case, you see the water, which is recycled from rainwater. It linked uh, the experience from inside the museum to the city. It allowed beauty to be part of the solution, which is sustainable, which I think sometimes today when we think about it, people tend to still pigeonhole this into, oh, the most sustainability. But sustainability without beauty, without civic pride, would not make a long-lasting museum experience. So through the process, we have so many solutions and ideas, strategies about sustainable from material usage, energy, water, recycling, and so forth. So that would be another subject, but we did learn through the four years of working on that museum since no one was doing that in a museum context before. And that led on to the expansion to Speed Art Museum, which is a historic museum from 1926 that we added around 80,000 square foot to it. In this particular project, I coined the term acupuncture architecture, which is quite crucial to our conversation today. What does it mean? It means that instead of a facelift, instead, instead of a plastic surgery, we want the idea of acupuncture because it really identifies the problem point, the strategic points in around the museum. And when you do that, it's very efficient, but it also not only fix or expand the museum, it brings the overall wellness to the overall beauty, uh, the overall health of the building, which is, I think it's very crucial. It's not just adding something on, but it's rejuvenate the whole body. And that's concept that I will come back to when we talk about the Rockefeller Wing. This is the, the result of the museum. We really opened up the museum uh, to the city and to the campus of the college. We let art be part of everyday life as well as a special location to go to. Uh, another project, which is the Asian Art Museum, which just opened a year ago as well, again in a historic building um, uh, in downtown Civic Center in San Francisco. Uh, it was an all public library, so uh, the museum already uh, went in and was first renovated by Guy Olenti. Uh, from the Musée d'Orsay fame, and, and we have to then renovate and expand again because of the need of uh, the museums. And so we have done so by respecting the historic building, 
but also allow them to have something that they never have, which is one large 12,000 uh, uh, 12, square foot with column free. Because it was a public library, there's no big space that they can use for exhibition space. Uh, in this case, one of the concepts that I presented was the idea of moving a museum from a peacock to an octopus. And uh, what I mean by that is that museum as temple is designed as a peacock. It's beautiful, it's very centralized, and it's very contained. And so in order to do everything in the museum, you have to go through the lobby, you have to go through everything. If you want to do an event, the whole museum has to be open. If you want to do something, you know, there's a whole operations and security involved with that that everyone knows. So the idea of how can we actually flip it around and decentralize the museum into an octopus, where the museum components, cafe, auditorium, classrooms, or even galleries become different uh, uh, magnets that reach out into the, whether it's the park, whether it's the city, allow these parts to be function uh, independently, allow them to be able to operate on the different hours, and allow them to engage and magnet and bring people to the museum for the different reasons they come to. So this is what we have done. So above the 12,000 square foot uh, uh, gallery, we add, of course, 12,000 square foot art terrace, which you know, at the Met, this is very common because the Met rooftop is one of the most important outdoor space in the world. In this case, we have art uh, uh, insulation as well as classroom for children, place for children to have lunch, as well as events and many others. Uh, and then, you know, within the space, we also create this beautiful uh, street gallery. You see it on the street level as well as on the, uh, the exhibition space level that have program, contemporary arts program that you can see inside the museum and vice versa. Allow the museum building to activate that facade. Allow the art community to really create this street art on the street level as well as important contemporary art installation to happen that function. I think, again, the idea of bringing the city in and the art out has always been in our DNA as designers. And we're doing that with respect to the historic building. In this case, uh, the old building from 1926 is so designed with granite. So uh, we want to create something compatible but contemporary. So we use this uh, advanced technology in ceramic, large scale ceramic tile that really mimic the scale of the granite but have its own uh, design. And then the window is a design with that DNA or that design in mind. Uh, in addition to museum, we also have other type of project. I just pick one, which is the art studio hall at Pomona College uh, in Clermont. This is moving from cultural presentation to cultural production. How do we allow students and faculty to work together, focus on their own craft, painting, drawing, photography, digital art, but also fusing into a meaningful cross-cultural, cross-discipline manner. So this is a space we design. The outside of the building is planned to design to really relate to the mountains around the campus. The inside is made as an, almost like a law of uh, industrial building where a lot of art is worked in to make it flexible for any kind of art to be in. One section that our museum's workshop have been working from the beginning is the idea of the interior, shall we say, the museum design, the scenography, and the exhibit design. Such a first project is the master plan for the gallery installation at the Art Institute of Chicago, which we worked there from 2007 to 2011. So we worked with the museum team along with Renzo Piano, who was designing the modern wing on the left-hand side. So as the modern wing become available, a lot of art is moving out to the modern wing, allow the museum and ourselves to reconfigure what's the right flow, circulation, and sequence of experience with the existing galleries. So we did the master plan with the team at the museum, and then staying on to design some of these galleries as become available, as the space become available. So at the end, we designed around nine galleries at the campus, include the uh, Greek and Roman ga art galleries in the cloister, the center of the building. We have U European decorative arts, we have prints and drawings, we have folk art, and also Japanese art. And that's uh, such a fulfilling experience to be able to see, again, acupuncture, point by point, and allow the flow to be better, allow the storytelling of the museum to be more cohesive because of sequence of the experience of the museum. 
We also doing design, for example, this is uh, the uh, samurai exhibition that we designed for the County Museum in Los Angeles. And I would like to point this out for one reason, is because most of these materials are light sensitive, but the room doesn't have to look gloomy because the way that we use light in different way could be uplifting for people, but also safe and durable for artworks. So the lighting design in these is, doesn't have to be all like five foot candle on every surface of the room, which is something we can come back to. But this is something that has become uh, quite a good uh, project that everyone knows us about. Leading on to the project just before the Rockefeller, which is the Harvard Art Museums. In this case, it's a big challenge because it was a new museum that combined the three completely separate museums into one. Many of you might know. It used to be the Falk Museum, the Bush Reisinger, and the Sackler, with three separate museum teams that are from three continents. So the idea from the university to combine it into one museum. So we work with the curators, conservators, and the professors for two and a half years to really engage conversation about how can we have this place? How can we link into the three? These three collections do not really have been collected to be together but how do we focus on each so they have their rightful installation, focus on what it used to be. It is, it is a teaching museum, so it fo focuses on close looking critical thinking. So how each of that will succeed, and then on top of that, how can start to really introduce the idea of collaboration, the idea of visual connection across the wing, from Sackler to Falk, and even the art installation itself. So it has been such a rewarding experience. I learned so much from all the curators and all the conservators about how to really bring the story to forward. Recent project is the Academy, Academy Museum, which is uh, the first film museum in Los Angeles that finally happened, which is two, opened two years ago. For me, it's really quite a, a privilege to be able to work on uh, film culture, not only just talk about history of film, but the people, the craft, the techniques, and the science behind it. And so we continue to be involved with the museum, helping them with exhibition, helping them with open spaces, how to evolve this into a place that is not just about the past or the story, but about how we bring the new filmmakers of the future, how do we inspire people with the material we have on the exhibit. So the last why is why museums? And I'm sure everyone here already have the answer and understand, so it's quite obvious. But my take on these is that, because museums, as someone who move around a lot and go from, you know, immigrant in a place that I don't live in the place I was born, I was living in a place that I was educated and move around as a nomad, I think museums matter because it really reflects who we are, where we come from and where we're going collectively, not just one of us, but together. So that's important. You see that in films, you see it in art. And the other is that museums are now being a place of conversation, place that we bring in concrete subjects into the discussion. For example, the Northwest Coast Hall at the uh, American Museum of Natural History just across the park from here that just opened a few months ago, really working with basically a period room. It was made uh, in 1896 by curated and designed by Francis Boas, who's the father of modern anthropology in America, which then became professor at Columbia University and educate everyone from Ruth, Ruth Benedict to many others. So the idea of how you touch a historic place that has such a good intentions, but the conversation, the relationship with us and the native population has been gone so much that we cannot continue to sustain such a storytelling. So we then engage uh, with all of the local populations and, 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 and nations along the coast. I spent three months traveling and living with many nations, really engage them, getting their trust to understand, and really weaving their voice and voices into it. So in this place, if you see today, this is what was built in 1896. This is our groundbreaking, we include everyone involved. And then of course we moved the Grand Canoe to be part of the narrative of the story of the wing. And this is what it is today. And it is something that is fully a co-creation. 
uh, all of the curators from the Native nations are very involved in the selection, the storytelling, and many others. We spent two years weaving the stories, all the voices together. We carefully look at how we integrate technology that allow the story to be told with the objects and as we move from one culture to the other. So that's something that I, our team is also very proud about. And for the first time, I also feel that this is really a symphony of ideas, that everyone come together. Our role is to make sure that we're the conductor that help the voices and the skill to come together into a symphony. And lastly, uh, I think before we go into the wing, is the idea that I'm very excited about is museums as sites of empathy. Again, uh, as someone who move around, I th I, it's so important that uh, we have a place that we learn to appreciate each other's, we, we learn to appreciate each, each other's food, we learn to appreciate each other's music, we can learn to appreciate each other's stories, religions, agendas, and bring this empathy to the forefront. Because without that, I don't know how we can really move together as a unity forward. I think museums has a great potential and play a big role already in that sense of understanding and empathy. So uh, how museum grow? Now I'm gonna lead directly to the Rockefeller wing. Museum grow, sometimes some museum grow by trying to make themselves a look inflate as big as possible, the grandeur of things, the better. Or sometimes museums grow like Frankenstein, like having different limbs and different parts from different things and they all fragment into its own being for the sake of being together. Again, I would like to adv advocate the idea of acupuncture architecture, which, which I mentioned before, it's about understanding, just like being a doctor, and really looking at the patient and, and prescribe precise intervention and strategies around specific areas of the body to be able to, to really uh, release the flow, defragmentalize the functions, bring overall great health to it. The result is the complete rejuvenation. It's not just about the Rockefeller wing, but by doing the Rockefeller wing, it should help the entire med body to be better flow, to be better connected and less fragmentalized. And of course, the long is the health of the, the, the institution because this museum will continue for so many generations after us. We only touch it for such a very short time of this museum. So we should not do anything short-lived or something that will, will, will not bring the right legacy to the building. So I think the idea of that is crucial. So now let me quickly go into the design before I sit down with Alisa to have a conversation. So we start uh, almost like acupuncture the wing with, with the model. And this is uh, the New York Times uh, magazine in 1982 when the wings opened. You can see that the grandeur, the big windows, and many others. And this, just many of you, let me situate where the wing is in relation to, to the overall Met Museum. So the, the, that AOA used to be the, the name of the Rockefeller wing, is there 40,000 square foot, roughly 200 by 200 feet, um, uh, 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 surrounded by great neighbors, Greek and Roman to the east, modern country to the west, and ESDA, which is European sculpture and decorative arts to the north. So these portals are very crucial to how we think about how do we deploy layout and design to the museum. But if you look at the previous layout, uh, one thing which is problematic from the get-go is that this is a south-facing, full-glass design of an architecture. What you see on that part is 200 feet long uh, glass curtain wall from floor to ceiling. Uh, in a room that most of the objects are actually light sensitive. So that has always been, uh, you know, the challenge of this wing before we got involved. And so if you, if you see the previous layout, there's a lot of rooms and blockage because we don't want the light to come through. We want the big object to be close to the light and then we, you know, be able to create the low ceiling, high ceiling aspect. So there's this sense of really let's make special room for these objects away from the light and let's move from the large object close by. But as you can see, and this is a, a photograph from the previous design, it actually looked brighter than it actually was because of maybe the camera, but everything was basically like five foot candle because of the material and the sensitivity to the light. 
And on top of the plan, we can see this section here. I don't want to go technical, but you can see that from the north, which is on the right-hand side, and, and the south, which is where the window is, there's this change in ceiling because of the anatomy of the wing. From very high ceiling to half low ceiling and high, and then full exposure to the light to the south. So that's the anatomy of the space within the, the wing that we inherited. And so within that, you know, we start, this is, you know, a good existing conditions. Uh, the current wall was towards the end of its life. So it started to have leakage, condensation problem that, of course, not friendly to the artwork, especially light sensitive and organic materials. The shade has always been down because we cannot let the light through or through the objects. So that is something that, of a challenge that we engage and celebrate. And this is how the three uh, departments also relate. Uh, by, by this sense, uh, which in a way doesn't make sense because uh, with Oceania being all the way to the windows, uh, which in include a lot of light sensitive materials. And so how do we improve uh, the layout of the three regions within the new wing, allow the flow to be better, allow us to take advantage of the park is the beginning how that we want to talk about. So in the beginning, we start to think about how do we plan the flow of the three regions? Do we do it vertically, from east to west, horizontally from north to south? And after so many trials, together with the department, we like the idea of diagonal, which is in a way, uh, simply say that just let the continents be continents and let ocean be ocean. <laughs> yeah, in the sense that Africa here in orange, is one continent connected to Europe and Greek and Roman. It also occupies both the high ceiling and low ceiling. It has most licensed materials that can be a bit further away from it. Americas, uh, which have quite some light-friendly materials, stones and metals and other, can be closer to the window and create its own chunk, which include high ceiling and low ceiling as well, with Oceania flowing between the two continents. And that the fluidity of the space also suggests the work, suggests a sense of place that could happen. And this is uh, a view just to kind of give you a hint of what that looked like uh, as you enter from Greek and Roman into uh, Africa. So the first hound is we're dealing with three quarters of the earth in 40,000 square feet. There's 91 countries represented in this more than 600 cultures packed into this space. When you look at these, you understand how difficult it is to do justice, not to the regions, but each of the culture which are so different within Africa, within Oceania. How do we bring the clarity, the distinction to this? So that obviously is the first. And we start looking at the objects. Let the object tell the story. Let the object engage in why people deepen into the understanding of the culture they represent. From Africa to Oceania, you can see the scale, which is so different, and Americas. Right? How do you really, uh, using these objects as ambassadors to it, and this is the scale, as you can see. And so we start with the collection, but at the same time, we are also looking at the living heritage of the men architecture. We start looking around and say, well, what is that experience of architecture as we move around in the Met, especially towards the circulation leading us to the wing, from the Great Hall, obviously, Greek and Roman, the main party and others, start to understand how people experience architecture. You know, styles is one thing, but the party and the DNA. You can start to see how walls and floor and ceiling really form the experience, how light enters the room, how proportion of space start to define the different cultures as we move through the space. So this gives us a hint of the DNA of the kind of continuity we want to create within the Met design. But at the same time, we also look back at the collection and say, uh, we need some references, we need a suggestion of the sense of place that these objects are made of. We're not gonna make anything bombastic like a special exhibition, but we want something that suggests the proportion. For example, in Africa, we look at the Great Mars in Chene, which lead on to this idea of the Ong Filad and the idea of different chapels that come out from the Ong Filad, just like that space. 
uh, for the Americas, we start looking at the spatial configuration that you have you know, in, uh, in city planning or the pyramid and the plaza. You can see how the positive and negative spaces suggest each other as one moves through these monuments which lead themselves to how we group the different cultures within the Americas and how we bring clarity to so how they might be close but they're quite different in how the, you know, the, the, the art represents. And of course the tectonic and placemaking that exists in the Oceania. And how we talked about uh, this kind of sense of place that can we bring uh, suggests the idea of that particular place uh, that could also discern between Africa, Oceanians and the Americas. And then again, back to the idea of the ceiling height, as which I, we talked about, we try to find a way to create a sense of continuity between a high ceiling and low ceiling, flowing from north to south, from dark to light in terms of the natural light. So that's how we do. We also started to look at large objects that we can position within this space to link people in different spaces, using artwork as landmark to guide people towards that experience within the wing itself. For example, this is the wing looking from Africa towards the window. You're roughly around 200 feet away from the window, but you can see uh, this is the on the enfilade for Africa. And so you can see that each uh, culture have this somewhat chapel-like spaces that people can focus and look at it. There's, there's a definition of the different uh, culture that can define. But there are some uh, flexible spaces that can change exhibition, uh, contemporary art or focus gallery could happen as we change this place along. Again, this is again the opposite side, which is coming in from modern contemporary into Oceania. Again, uh, one thing that I would like us to note is that this gallery is full of licensed materials. It's almost unfair to come from a 200 foot candle in the Greek and Roman with all the marbles and come to this very gloomy dark space. So we have to design something that's uplifting from the get go. People need to feel like, oh, there's something exciting. There's awe and uplifting quality. I want to know more about it. Even though we're dealing with materials that cannot take a lot of light. So that's something that we're trying to do as well in Oceania. We use a soaring uh, aspect, the beach poles, and some of the other large scale to really draw people into the room as they flow to the ocean, shall we say, of the galleries towards the window. And the window is uh, a subject that come up often, which is that line uh, that you see from there. So we want to do the, the best justice to the artwork, the preservation, the condition, the climate control of it. Uh, when you look at that, there's a lot of materials that are light sensitive. So how do we position this object that, that we can take advantage of the light, but also preserve to the best quality of the artwork? Uh, one of the things that we do is the, the way that we orient these walls in the northeast, northwest, um, sorry, north-south orientation, allow the view of the park to be, to be integrated, to be invited into the, into the wing deeper. Even though you might be 200 feet away, you still see the park all the way through. You can feel the sense of light. You can see uh, even licensing material with some park background, which is something that, of course, they were intended to do. For example, in this case, uh, this looking at the, Afri uh, that the America's gallery, you might be roughly around 100 feet away, but you feel that you see the connection, you see the park, and you feel people have a choice of moving around and be able to uh, sort of refresh themselves. I mean, you know, with, with the, but we also have spaces like this that are focused on specific things. For example, this is a gallery dedicated to textile that uh, with uh, the frequent rotations that the artwork provide, allow people to look closely, allow this to be its own chamber that you know, allow rotation to happen easier and focus on the story. And Center Park, as we talked about, uh, with our great team at Bayer Bell, we are also working on upgrading this uh, curtain wall glass, make it larger, less obstruction, uh, the best uh, technology on glass walls so that we can contain uh, low energy consumption uh, as well as the control, kind of control for the art, as you can see here. quickly on construction, as you can see from Central Park outside. Again, this space is still, this is one of the early studies. It's gonna be many things, including contemporary art, including a place for contemplation, focus gallery, but it has a place that now Central Park is part of the exhibition and part of the wing experience. Again, construction itself. 
And lastly, uh, talk about accessibility and flexibility. What we talked about is the idea of really creating portals into the space, not just for the North Promenade, but all through deploying the sense of connection throughout the wing. Uh, deploying these uh, different portals, creating good relationship between all of them. This is the flow in Oceania that we talked about. Many of the objects need to be within casework and pedestal and vitrine. And so for the flexibility, we work closely with our engineers, lighting designer, casework designer, to make sure that the casework are easy to use, easy to open and install for rotation and change of exhibition. And we go from design to mock-up to prototype, even on site, to make sure that the solutions uh, are good for the team who will be operating and maintaining the collection. And the tools that we use to achieve all of these uh, is something that I'm very proud about. We start from the physical model, which everyone understands. Large-scale model, if you go to the office now, you can still see them. With all the walls you play, it allows us to understand the totality of the work, how things relate to each other, as you can see. But we also enhance this with 3D modeling and walkthrough. And the reason why is because it allows you to understand visual connection on site. If you look right or look left, uh, what do you see? Are you going to see this object with that object if you turn around? Allow us to plan this serendipity uh, or, you know, in many ways, including this sightline and visual connection within the regions and between the region as well. And the other part which is quite important to the design is how we emphasize the threshold or the portal between neighboring departments. In this case, from Greek and Roman into Africa, how do we talk about that story? What are the objects that can bring the story to, to life? Or in this case, from modern contemporary art into the Oceania, what kind of visual connections and clue that we can suggest that bring this story up in, you know, in harmony? In this case, uh, from ESTA, which is European Sculpture and Decorative Art, into Africa itself. So uh, to conclude, uh, is what we're trying to do is we're trying to be the matchmaker between art and people. We want people to love art, and we want art to love people back. And when we do that, we're trying to create spaces that people feel comfortable, and art really are uplifting. And we try to do that to our best ability, both in terms of the high, high ceiling, like what you see here is with natural light, or even close looking into the world, whether it's textile or gold or materials, allow each of the materials to sing and have difference in, in their own way. And this is like uh, Ocean again. Again, to conclude, um, this is again the 82 cover from the New York Times Magazine, the Met's New Treasure, a showcase for primitive art. What I would like us to think about that it is, of course, the newest and greatest treasure, but it's a site of inspiration, but also importantly, it's a site of cultural empathy that I think we all need to put in the back of the mind as we experience and curate the, the pl place. And I would like to thank, this is my team, uh, which is in New York and LA, many of them are in this room, to talk about how diverse we are. We have so many countries and culture represented within the, the, the team, and that's also our strengths. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kulapat, for that highly revealing and intimate insight into your professional practice. Um, I had been asked to end the program with a few questions. We pretty much are at the balance of our time, but um, let's just round out this evening with, um, I had a, um, an opportunity to look back on the proposals that we reviewed uh, by different firms who um, uh, expressed interest in taking on the challenge of this project. And I realize that it's, it's been seven years since um, you um, proposed yourself as uh, our creative partner in this venture. And 
Um, as you saw in some of Kulapat's images, the work really is physically underway. Um, our colleagues at Bayer Binder Bell just told me that the first pane of glass um, for the replacement glass wall was put into place uh, today. So, um, you know, we are very much um, far along in this, this journey. Um, and just one comment and reflection from, you know, listening to your, um, your presentation just now, um, you know, we all in American museums are very conscious of the um, desire to enhance the visitor experience of museums. And um, you, in your reflections, you were emphasizing the pure enjoyment of the museum as a playground rather than a temple. As a curator, I think very much in terms of the need to broaden narratives um, in the museum environment um, and to expand our sense of what creative genius has and can be. And with the cultural empathy that you invoked, um, I, I wonder if we might think of these reimagined galleries uh, that you've been immersed in as a site of wonder in which visitors can be confronted with the unfamiliar and yet connect with it in a deeply personal way. Um, so that is a comment, a reflection, and I open it up to you to round out this evening. Well, thank you, Alisa. I think uh, we all uh, have had so many conversations about this too, right? And the idea that, yes, I think, I love what you said, sight of wonder. I think that definitely is in the soul of any museum because there are windows open to opportunities, to creativity, to every one of us, uh, and that's the museum, that for sure. Uh, when I mention uh, that I think museum moving from temple to playground, um, I might not be necessarily thinking about the fun aspect of it, even though it should be there, but more about the way that the experience should be non-hierarchical and non-directive, that you can choose your own journey. You know, if you uh, look at, you know, children going to a playground, they were so seduced by all of the different opportunities they can engage with. They're going to start here first and do this last. It's a very empowering experience, which is not directive, which I think that, as you mentioned, you know, museums have always built as a place for people to come to encounter cultures. They already have... Uh, a, a inferior experience to it. Oh, I need to know about this thing I'm looking at. So it's more empowering. So therefore, it is about giving them options of experience, giving them opportunity to choose where and how, what they want to look at, and then hopefully within what you mentioned, the site of wonder will also be there for them to discover and get new surprises. Oh. Thank you, and we are at time, so I'm going to invite all of you to join me in thanking Kulapat for sharing his thoughts with us this evening. Um, it's very important to see um, how this project, which will transform a major crossroads of the Met's campus fits in with the constellation of projects that you've developed over the course of your career. Um, so join me in, in thanking Kulapat Yan. Thank you very much.